Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Chris Corsi. I'm the chair of the Board of Supervisors of, of Sonoma County. And I want to welcome you to what's now our second webinar to discuss plans to create emergency shelter sites as a means to address our recurring issues with homeless encampments on the Joe Redota Trail. Over the last four years, the county has repeatedly closed sections of the trail due to public safety concerns caused by the growing encampments. Today, as many as 75 individuals are camping along the trail in Southwest Santa Rosa. Because of a number of court decisions over the past several years, the county is legally constrained in how we're able to respond to these situations. Local governments can't prohibit camping on public property unless beds are available at alternative locations for those campers, or if those individuals, individuals otherwise have the means to acquire shelter. Last week, during an emergency session, the Board of Supervisors voted to declare a shelter crisis and to approve the creation of up to two emergency shelter sites for homeless individuals. I'd like to note that while there was an urgent need to take action because of the growing situation along the trail, these decisions were not made in haste or in a vacuum. County staff have been evaluating our options for addressing this situation for a long time. Additionally, I'd like to add that the locations of the sites have not been finalized. Today is the second of two outreach meetings that we're hosting to address questions and to receive public feedback about these sites. During our first webinar on Friday, we discussed the possibility of establishing an emergency shelter at the county government campus in Northern Santa Rosa. That site is in the parking lot outside the Permit Sonoma office, offices located near the corner of Ventura Avenue and Admi Administration Drive. A recording of that web webinar is available on the county's Facebook page and the YouTube channel in English and Spanish. Today, we're focusing on a second site, the parking lot of the Veterans Memorial Building at 1351 Maple Avenue in Santa Rosa. A recording of today's webinar also will be available on the county's Facebook page and the county's YouTube channel for those of, of you who want to see it again, or if you want to tell friends uh, or neighbors who haven't been able to attend this evening. I'm happy to be joined today by Sonoma County Supervisor Susan Gorin, who represents the first district of Sonoma County, by Santa Rosa City Council member Chris Rogers, whose district includes the Santa Rosa Veterans Memorial Building and the neighborhoods around it, Dave Kiff, the Director of Homelessness Services in our Department of Health Services, will have a presentation to address the operations and security of these managed shelter sites. We'll also hear from the Director of the Department of Health Services, Tina Rivera, who will go over the services that will be provided to the residents of these locations. We're gonna to get to them in a minute. I just wanna start with two questions that are the most frequently, um, frequently asked of me. And those are why now and why here? Why now is because this is an urgent situation. The, the encampments on the Joe Redota Trail have doubled in size twice in the past month. At 75 people, if they double again, it's 150 people. You'll recall I said that in order to clear these camps, we have to have enough beds for people, for the people who are camping there to be, um, to be sheltered in. So we don't wanna run out of the room that we're creating as we create it. We need to have shelter available in order to clear the sites, the trail, and this will give us to offer that, the opportunity to offer that shelter now. As far as why here, and again, we're looking at a couple of different sites, neither one of which has been selected yet. But these two sites are being discussed because they're owned by the county. We can control what happens on them. 
They are close to services, close to transit for the folks who will live there as they, as they transition into permanent housing. They're available now, shelter can be stood up quickly. We hope to answer as many of your questions today uh, as possible, and we'll take the time to do that. Uh, I'm first gonna turn this over to my, my, my colleague, not my supervisor, my colleague, <laughs> Supervisor Susan Gorin, who wants to say a few words. Thank you, Supervisor Corsi. I am pleased to be with you tonight. And I wanna assure you that I listen very carefully and treat this neighborhood with the respect that it deserves. Uh, tonight's uh, focus really is on the Veterans Building and I hope to get as many questions as possible about this. And I've corresponded with many of you saying, this was the first neighborhood that I lived in when I first moved to Santa Rosa, probably 37 years ago. I walked all of the streets. My children attended Brook Hill School with many of your children. So I treasure it. It is a fabulous neighborhood close to services. And I want to make sure my comments tonight really are focused on assuring you that I will do what it takes to advocate for you, the users of the Veterans Building, the neighbors, and all of the users groups that may rent out the Veterans Building to make sure that if this parking lot is chosen as one of the encampment sites, it will be well managed. It is simply not a repeat of the Redota Trail. It's going to be very different. And the reason I know this is because the very same thing happened uh, to my neighborhood of Oakmont a number of years ago when the conditions on Redota Trail unraveled so quickly and we needed to clear the trail and make space for many of the folks living on the trail to be in a safe and secure environment. Thus, uh, many of the campers along Redota Trail moved to Los Gulacos Village right across the street from us. And I, I had severe objections to that location, not because of the kind of folks who were camping on the trail and moving into LG Village, but because it was far away from services. That is not the case with either of these two locations. They're closer to services. Uh, and I think it will be a better place for the campers to move to because they will be able to access services um, more easily and more comfortably. So one of the keys to the success that I would encourage you to take advantage of is I had the very same neighborhood meeting where the folks in Oakmont and businesses were up in arms, very concerned about the security and how well the pellet shelter home village would function. And yet the operator was fabulous. Uh, St. Vincent de Paul, very responsive to neighborhood concerns and Oakmont formed a neighborhood group to work with the operator on a weekly, sometimes daily basis to ensure that that, is, that uh, LG Village was well managed and there was no impacts on the neighborhood or surrounding businesses. Because even though you think Los Gulacos is far away from Oakmont, has a lot of sensitive uses on that campus and as well as wineries surrounding it, so we needed to make sure that that was a safe environment for the neighbors and businesses, and we did exactly that. So the folks serving on that committee uh, have just been a very complimentary, and they are convinced that we too can establish a safe and secure managed encampment at either or both of these locations. And so um, I, I would encourage you to make sure that you ask the questions in the chat or send a letter because we intend to answer all of your questions and make sure that you are speaking for many folks in the neighborhoods and so that we can really understand your concerns and potential fears. Um, I'm, I don't think the fears are gonna be realized because we have, will be making a commitment to ensure that impacts are not realized on the neighborhoods and the user groups of the veterans building or the county campus. 
So thank you for listening and thank you for all of the panelists participating. I, I know I was one of you um, having concerns about it and it, and it worked out uh, with a high graduation rate out of Los Coast Village. And we hope the same thing can happen with these two or one managed encampments that people will access the services and move into permanent supportive housing and eventually reintegrate into the community. So thank you, Chair Corsi. Let's turn it back over to you. Thank you, Supervisor. I also wanna recognize uh, Councilman Rogers, um, who uh, I believe um, might have a few words. No, I really appreciate that Supervisor and, and Supervisor Gorn and all of the staff that are here and the neighbors who are here to participate as well. Uh, I do wanna call out one of my colleagues, Mark Sapp, a uh, newly elected council member is also in attendance. Uh, he doesn't represent the Veterans Hall uh, himself, but he has both roads that go along it uh, in his district. Uh, so he's obviously very concerned as well of all of his surrounding neighbors that he represents, uh, that their voices are heard and that their concerns are met with appropriate answers and action. Uh, I do wanna just thank uh, the county for allowing the city to be here to participate. Uh, our role is very simple. Uh, whatever sites the county does select, whether it's this one, the administrative campus, or other sites that are evaluated, Russell Avenue uh, or the, the fairgrounds, uh, that we make sure that it works for everybody, that it, it uh, addresses the concerns of the neighbors that we all represent, uh, while also keeping the folks uh, that are desperate for help to get off the streets uh, safe as well. Uh, we're here to listen. Uh, I, as I mentioned, I appreciate all of the emails that I've received from neighbors. I apologize to those I haven't gotten back to yet. I will, I promise. Uh, we're still trying to get as much information as you are to make sure that this is as successful as possible uh, once the county decides where they're going to, to, to locate it. Thank you, Supervisor. Thank you, Councilman. Um, and thanks to Councilman Stapp for being here, um, not just tonight, but I understand he was with us Friday too, and I'm sorry that uh, I didn't realize that then. Um, so we're going to get to questions in just a second here. Just a uh, couple ground rules. If you'd like to pose a question for our panelists or make a comment, we invite you to post your question in the Q&A box at the bottom of the Zoom screen or the top if you're on a different device. Um, it's the Q&A screen. We have staff members here who will respond in writing. Uh, and if time allows, we hope to address uh, all these questions verbally as well. If you're following via social media, you can also post your question in the comments area of the Facebook or YouTube page where you're watching, members of the staff will share them with panelists. Uh, finally, you're invited to email questions and comments um, now or later to publicaffairs at sonomacounty.org. That's publicaffairs, one word, at sonoma-county.org. Um, we're gonna take questions and comments from the public in just a couple minutes. First, um, because so many questions about, are about what these shelter sites will look like. Um, our homeless services director, director Dave Kiff, is going to um, take a couple minutes to describe what the project will be like. Dave. Thank you, Supervisor Corsi. I wanted to also thank all the audience members for being here. Um, please know that myself and uh, our director, Tina Rivera, and our team, we take this issue very seriously. We take the issue of neighborhood concerns and neighborhood safety very seriously. So as Supervisor Corsi mentioned, I'm gonna briefly go through a couple of slides. I'm gonna to start to share my screen. So this is a little similar to a presentation that we made to the Board of Supervisors last Tuesday. Um, just a reminder of what Supervisor Corsi said, the crisis. Uh, this is what it looks like on the Joe Redota Trail. This is an unmanaged encampment. Um, these are folks living out in the elements with no support. Um, and, and this kind of crisis brings about the emergency declaration that talks about the risk to the public's health and safety, including the folks who live on the trail, um, including the folks who use the trail who might transit through there in its, in its intended purpose. 
But today, again, as emphasized by Supervisor Corsi, we have the problem is we have very limited places to offer the folks that live there if we're to clear the trail. And we're, we've experienced this cycle that we're stuck in where um, people are housed just for a very short amount of time. They return to the trail, we clear the trail, they're housed for a short amount of time, again, because we don't have the longer term opportunities. Um, and it becomes a relatively lawless environment. The trail is attractive because it's hidden, it's out of the way. Um, so we're, we're trying to end that with this action. So what is the solution? Um, this is one of them. And this is consistent with a strategic plan that um, cities, that the, a group called the Continue of Care, which is government agencies and service providers across the county, agreed should be part of our portfolio. And that is this concept of a managed encampment. Um, the ones we're proposing it, are up to two. Uh, they'd have 24 seven security. They'd be structured tents. This is a picture of what some of the tents look like. It's underneath a canopy. And then it has an actual tent inside it that fits within the canopy. Easy Up makes these. Uh, they're available on Amazon. It's a fairly good product, fairly inexpensive. Uh, there's security fencing around the perimeter. This is typically chain link with screening, with visual, visual screening. Uh, for the folks inside, there's restrooms and shower service. There's no use of adjacent buildings. Uh, we, do, we do bring in uh, food. It's likely to be one meal a day with opportunities for snacks the rest of the day. That tends to be what, what is a working model that's been effective. There are quiet hours. There are good neighbor policies that everyone is expected to sign when they enter this facility um, and associated with a behavioral agreement. Pets are typically okay. There's usually a little area for dogs to run and some people will keep pets in their tents. Uh, there's a mobile office for case managers and Tina will talk more about that, but what the services are provided. Because the essential thing about this that's not happening on the trail is that we have people housed, even in a tent, but we also have case managers around them consistently to help them uh, get in the, to the next step in housing. Um, drug or alcohol use will be prohibited on site. And as mentioned, uh, the wraparound services will be provided on site. Um, this is a diagram that shows something you're familiar with, obviously the veterans building. In our conversations with the folks at the veterans building, their preference, if there is a preference, is to have this uh, this emergency shelter location behind the building. So um, again, this part of the of the diagram, this is just a closer up vision of that. And again, we're envisioning about 20 different tents. There's a possibility we could work out a partnership with the city of Santa Rosa to accommodate a number of RVs. Uh, that action is really to be determined yet. We certainly like the input of the folks attending today. I have one more slide. Um, I, I think it's important to know that we've done this already. We we're doing this and that we, we wouldn't recommend it if we didn't think it was safe to the neighborhood. And that's because we do have a track record. Um, for instance, in Runner Park, the managed, the, lake, the managed encampment at Roberts Lake, um, the police report that actually calls have gone down since it's been there, since it's been an, from, went from an unmanaged encampment to a managed encampment. Um, Labath Landing is an interim housing site, brand new in Runner Park, and that has had no reported increase at all in calls to the entire neighborhood. As Supervisor Gorin mentioned, a Los Gilicos village, we had two police calls in the entire last year, and those involved the incidents inside, um, not outside. Horizon Shine is a managed RV facility in Sebastopol. And the police chief there said, you know, what we've noticed is a significant reduction in homelessness calls outside of the town, sorry, outside of the encampment, uh, but inside the town. And then finally, the, the county itself and our contractors operate three different sites, not unlike this. They're home key one sites. They're, they're two hotels, Hotel Azura in Santa Rosa, the Sebastopol Inn in Sebastopol, and then trailer, the trailer site at the fairgrounds. And we haven't seen any kind of change in calls to these sites. And, the, and we don't have any, any records from the police about concerns about the folks that live there. And again, that's because we have security around them 24 seven. 
It's also because they become a stable housing environment for vulnerable people. I want to make sure there's a reason that it's both security and the fact that there's new, new stability in these folks' lives. And then lastly, I mentioned there's a brand new um, Home Key 2 site in Healdsburg. Um, the police there reported no change in calls before or after that came into being. I'm going to stop there and turn it back to Supervisor Corsi. Thanks, Dave. <clears throat> We're going to hear from Tina Rivera, our Director of Health Services, uh, to talk about the kind of services that will be provided to the residents of, of these shelters. Tina, I'm going to ask you to keep it, keep it brief but thorough because we've got uh, 83 questions now in the uh, Q&A and about 200 participants who are, are waiting to get questions answered. But please uh, let us know what, what services will be available to residents. Okay, thank you, Chair Corsi. Uh, I wanna talk uh, just briefly about the services and supports that will be provided at the site. Uh, the purpose of these services and supports is to improve the health and the well-being and the sustained recovery and the self-sufficiency of these vulnerable residents uh, among us and to address these um, challenges that accompany homelessness and, and that can interfere with obtaining that the long-term housing stability, which is our goal. So the goal is to wrap around these supports and services uh, for every aspect of their life. So we will be providing mental health, housing, uh, community um, supports that will help to break these particular barriers. And in uh, particular, we'll be providing uh, things such as Medi-Cal enrollments, uh, general assistance enrollments, CalFresh enrollments, uh, sec social security enrollments. Uh, there'll be identification assistance and other types of basic needs assistment assistance that individuals will need to get back on their feet. There'll also be assistance with law enforcement. Um, case managers will continue to work through care plans and housing plans on a daily basis. So individuals will not be waiting until the last minute uh, to ensure that they are working through care plans and case plans and housing plans in order to look at what the next steps are uh, on their way to housing placements. Uh, also, what's, what will be offered is residential substance use treatment if, should this be needed, uh, any, any medication support or transportation support, and then coordinated entry referrals. And I just wanted to say before I turn it back over to Chair Corsi is that these individuals are not strangers to our staff or strangers to our providers. Our community, our case managers have been working with these individuals for a number of years. So so these are individuals who have fallen into um, homelessness, and but, but our staff are familiar with these individuals, and they have been working with them on a consistent basis. And so persistence is the key in order to move them along in their quality of life. So at this time, I'll turn it back over to you, Chair Corsi. Thanks, Tina. Thanks, Dave. Susan and Chris as well. Um, we're going to go to some questions now. A lot of these are, um, you know, there, as I said, there are more than 80 questions in the Q&A. Some of them are repetitive. We probably won't get to all of them, but we're going to get to as many as we can. Um, Paul Gullickson, our communications manager, will moderate the Q&A. So take that away, Paul. Okay. Thank you, Chair Corsi. Um, and thank you, everybody. We want to remind everyone uh, following us that if you have registered for this webinar, and have joined us by Zoom, you can pose your questions or comments by simply uh, posting them in the Q&A box at the bottom mm -hmm. of your screen. If you're following us uh, live via Facebook or YouTube, you can leave your questions or comments in the comments area at the bottom of your screen as well. And one of our staff members will see it and pass it along uh, to, to us. 
Uh, finally, you're also invited, as, as Chair Corsi has mentioned, to uh, send your questions via email, if you prefer, to publicaffairs, one word, at sonoma-county.org. We are hoping to get to as many of your questions as possible, but as Chair Corsi mentions, we have we already have more than 80 in our Q&A box, and we have had more than 20 who have been, that have been emailed to it, 25 emailed to us in advance. So we're going to try to get to as many uh, of these questions as possible, but please know whether we get to your question or not, we will be collecting all of your questions and comments and sharing them, collecting them and sharing them internally. Um, we also will be collecting many of the questions and answers uh, posed and answered today and sharing them on the county's website for the benefit of those who are not able to join us today. So with that, let's get started. Uh, my uh, my staff and I have tried to group uh, some many of these questions into uh, certain categories. So we're going to start with questions that are focused on the operations of the shelter itself, details. And uh, some of this have, has already been mentioned, but I think uh, our, our followers are interested in specifics in some areas. One of them is really focused on uh, security and the question we're getting uh is will security be on site 24 hours a day and how many security uh, individuals will there be and what will security consist of well thank, thanks for that question uh there will be 24 7 security it will uh typically vary between uh one person two persons and sometimes three persons depending on the time of day and depending on who else is there remember we'll also have um, people um, providing services, as Tina mentioned, inside to to also complement the the uh, the services provided and this and the the care provided to the clients. Um, what there'll there'll be one entrance, one way in, and one way out. However, if there's ever an emergency, there'll be a a, a it's it's not a it's not a locked campus that someone couldn't get out because of safety or other reasons. So. Um, but there'll be you know, persons will have to check in whether you're a visitor or whether you're a, a resident of the encampment. Dave, I think it should be mentioned that um, you know the people who are here will be here voluntarily. Um, they'll be here because they uh, are seeking shelter and they're seeking services. Uh, th this is a place that uh, everyone who's there will be taking part in in the services that are offered and working their way toward uh, moving on from here to more permanent housing. That, that's a great point. And again, it speaks to the, the kind of folks who will choose to reside here. You would not choose to reside here if you want to flout the rules and, and behave badly. That's not going to work here. The people who will choose to reside here will be those that sign the agreement that, that states what they're going to, the rules they're going to comply with, the good neighbor policy that they comply with, and that they're going to be willing to participate in those programs. Okay, thank you. Uh, one of our uh, webinar attendees asks, uh, we had a number of questions about uh, lighting. Uh, one of our webinar attendees says, this neighborhood is extremely dark at night. Will the county install lighting and what will that look like? We we will have lighting. It's not it's supposed to be uh, limited lighting to not keep people awake. Whether you're if you're a resident of the emergency shelter or around the neighborhood, but it's typical that we'd have a lighting standard up or or two of them just to make sure we're keeping people safe inside. Okay. Um... Arlie from our web webinar audience also uh, asks, will food be provided? So as mentioned um, in our conversations with other entities that that um, such as Warner Park uh, will provide one full meal a day and then the opportunity to snack if and that's been kind of what has been a best practice and that's what people have asked for. Should the other thing that sorry the other thing that Warner Park is doing if if folks in the neighborhood want to participate is they do encourage the neighborhood to come in church group or otherwise and and help help with the food help build community in that sense and that's something we would certainly welcome i was just going to say dave that we should note that uh, the residents here are 
as I said before, they're not they're not here um, under arrest. They're not being detained here. They can come and go. Um, some of them do have income. Some of them do have jobs. Um, they don't have homes, but um, you know they may want to go out and get uh, get some food on their own as well. Um, Carol uh, emailed this question. She had some a question about specifics. How many people, tents, and RVs will be allowed? She's looking for a number here. How will you monitor the number of people in and out? Uh, will there be cur curfews or rules? Uh, and will there be conditions for pe allowing people to stay? That's a four-part question. The first one being how many, do you have a specific number of people or tents or RVs that will be allowed? So our concept is 40 tents. Um, our RVs, uh, we haven't finalized that yet. They're, we, what we want to try to do is respond to concerns we've heard from the city about um, the, the greatest impact to the city, one of the greater impacts to the city has been a shortage of safe parking places for RVs. So it needs to work with the site, needs to work with the adjacent neighborhood and the veterans. Um, as to uh, the amount of people, um, typically it's one person per tent, but we certainly have couples. So you could have 40 tents and maybe 46 or 48 people who might reside there. Uh, we don't think a larger size is beneficial. And as Supervisor Corsi mentioned, we're trying to hit just the right amount of, num amount of people to be able to clear the trail. Is there anything I left off there, Paul? I didn't want to uh, a follow up question is Will there be curfews or rules? Oh. And what will be the conditions for mm -hmm. uh, being a resident? As Supervisor Corsi mentioned, this is not a prison. Um, we have people who have jobs and have some of the jobs are after hours. So uh, that will be a conversation they'll have with the site managers, the service providers as to the hours that they come and go at. We will have quiet hours though. Those are likely to be 9 p.m. to 7 a.m. where people are expected to operate like they're in a neighborhood and be quiet. Um, we, we have had also questions about for the residents' sake, will residents, uh, how will they stay warm on uh, winter nights? And will the tents have electricities and access to space heaters? We're having that conversation right now with our building code officials. Um, our, our, our choice, our recommendation is to provide a warming area that could also become a cooling area in the summertime. Um, rather than have individual uh, <clears throat> individual heating devices in tents, it's not recommended that you have a heating device inside a tent like this. Okay, we have a, a, a few more just focused on uh, operations and then we'll move to another area. But um, uh, one questioner says, are there going to be job training opportunities and help obtaining employment uh, can you talk more about the wraparound services that will be available? Uh, I can answer that, Paul. Yes, there will be job training opportunities. Um, we work with workforce development. Um, <clears throat> our multidisciplinary teams, uh, our case managers who do liaise with um, businesses in the area, we work with human services closely. Uh, so there will be job, job training. We have help with resumes. Um, we, we will also provide clothing uh, when necessary for those particular interviews, things of that nature. So absolutely, uh, those are some of the activities that will be going on. Great. Thank you, Tina. Um, Terry asks uh, specifically, where are the funds coming from to pay for this? Uh, and especially where are the funds going to come from if it goes for more than a year? So the, the budget action that the board took last Tuesday involves two different sources of funds. One is the American Rescue Plan Act that has been allocated to the county. The other source is called an intergovernmental transfer fund, which is a reimbursement associated with the county's costs for Medi-Cal, treating Medi-Cal uh, clients. So uh, if it lasts, so again, our goal is that these are short term. We hope to provide people with a pathway to housing quickly. Um, as, I, as I mentioned earlier, I, I am an optimist. 
Um, I, there is no, new housing supply coming online, both in the affordable side and then the home key side, which are, there's, a, there's new places coming up in Petaluma, in the Russian River, um, and all, all across the county. It's not a lot, but it's, it's really changing the game at which, for which folks who are residing in this type of housing environment can then transition to once they're stabilized. So again, our hope is that this is not long-term, but if it is long-term, we would return to the board and request similar funding. Just to um, add a little bit to that, the board approved a year's worth of funding for up to two sites. Um, we have that money available now. Homeless funding is, is um, frustratingly fickle in that it's, uh, you don't know whether it's coming year to year and it comes, it comes in yearly cycles. So um, if we wanted to keep this going beyond a year, we would have to find uh, probably a different source of funding. Okay, uh, great. Um, Jessica asks, uh, she's concerned, are you, she's asked, are you allowing registered 290s. I'm presuming she means uh, sex offenders uh, by that. Are you allowing registered uh, sex offenders in the encampment? Uh, she points out that the Norquist Taylor Ballroom Dance School is located at the Vets building less than 2,000 feet away at, um, in, uh, from this camp. Um, thank you for that question, Jessica. We do not. Uh, we do not um, allow the, those 290s at any of our sites. Thank you for the question. Great, thank you, thank you, Tina. Okay, I, I'm gonna we're gonna switch over to another area, which is the potential impacts in the neighborhood. We'll take a few questions that we've kind of grouped there. Uh, Sally asks, are there restrictions on the homeless residents being ha the homeless people being housed at the Vets building from wandering around the adjacent neighborhoods? I don't. I, I, I just got to go back to the um, statement I made earlier that these people are here voluntarily. Uh, they're not being um, detained. They are residents of Sonoma County, like you and me. Uh, you know, they they have the right to walk down a street just as as any of us do. As as Dave pointed out, everybody will be you know there. They will have signed a good neighbor agreement. You know, they 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 don't want any more trouble than than anyone else does. Um, but there's not going to be any restrictions on on where and how they can travel. Okay, um, Stephen asks. Well, how will the county ensure that those in the surrounding areas uh, will protect will be protected? Will their, that their safety will be protected? Um, he says, I'm not confident the county can maintain the camp with security and sanitation to keep citizens safe, including the homeless. So I respect that question. I, I do, as, as I noted earlier, we, we wouldn't recommend this if we didn't think we could do it well. We do have a track record of doing this well. So um, our teams have worked, as Tina mentioned, our teams have worked with these clients for a period of time. The thing that they're missing in their lives is stable housing. And um, however, if if residents around the adjacent area uh, see crime going on, whether it's from a person who is currently unhoused or currently housed, or would be coming from our the encampment here, uh, it's always important to call the police. Uh, we will, however, be hyper aware of of where when any of our clients leave and decide to. Uh, not as Supervisor Corsi, Corsi mentioned, transit through the neighborhood, but loiter in the neighborhood. That's a, that's a thing that they would sign that part of good neighbor policies don't loiter in the neighborhood. And Paul, you know, I, I understand why people are concerned about this. Um, this. This is something that we can only, we can only answer these questions by showing that we do this right. Um, and I know that it's hard to, to believe that statement, but uh, we've seen this happen with other encampments like this, other shelter sites that have been stood up around the county. 
that are successful. Um, and we, we will do this right. And we'll make sure that this is, is not impactful on the neighborhood as far as crime and, and safety problems. Okay, uh, Deborah uh, asked a question that had been repeated by a, a few others. Uh, she asked, what happens to people who aren't following their rules and are asked to leave? Where do they go? So under an exit for not following the rules, again, also people could choose to leave because they don't like the rules. Um, they, would, they would be invited by our service provider to be taken to a, a safe place within Sonoma County that they'd like to go to. If they want to go further, we'd actually consider that too. But um, they're in, in discouraged from just leaving the, the gates and going into the neighborhood. In fact, that's also part of the good neighbor policy. Um, but it, again, if our preference and our recommendation will be that they take our opportunity for transit to the, a safe place of their choosing. Well, before you ask the next question, um, I don't want to put him on the spot, but, but Chris Rogers, the city has had some experience with uh, safe parking encampment uh, over on Stony Point Road. And I wonder if you have any experience uh, with some of the very questions that are being put to us right now in relation to that facility. Yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> and I will say, it's not just one encampment. We actually did do a safe parking uh, site at the Finley Community Center during the pandemic as well. Um, we not only walked the neighborhood, we had community meetings, we had ongoing community meetings, uh, and that would be one of my expectations with this as well is that there are ongoing community meetings uh, at whatever site is, is selected. Uh, and one of the things that I think was really important and key was for us to keep our promises to the neighborhood, that we explained the urgency and how we were going to determine when it was time to shut the, the site down. Uh, and then we did. Uh, and then when we decided to use the Stony Point location, we were able to point to that and our track record of working with neighbors that has been operating for over a year now with very little, if any, uh, incident. I have not heard any complaints from any of the neighbors. And I do understand that there is a nuance and a difference that this isn't right up against most neighbors' fences. Uh, but many of these concerns were brought up. Uh, similar concerns were brought up by staff who share the parking lot with the site, uh, with folks who were worried about loss of use of the park and of the facility. Uh, and that actually did not come to pass. Uh, and I think as, as many of the neighbors have heard me say, there was coexistence that has been able to be met there through dialogue, through building trust. Uh, and I, my, my hope is that this would be uh, similar. Thanks, Councilman. Yes, thank you very much. Um, so a couple of residents, uh, Sally asks, uh will a phone number be provided for someone at the site uh for assistance if the neighborhood needs to communicate with with someone at the site yes i i suppose we don't have that number yet but because we don't know where the site is so that's right we'll 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 be sure to push that out as soon as paul I, I wanted to emphasize too what council member rogers noted um we do intend to have a regular community dialogue and a forum for uh, folks who are neighbors to communicate with us um, face to face if, if on Zoom or otherwise in person too, but um, to make sure that people have know that know who's responsible and who to call when something goes awry. Excellent that that addresses another series of questions that people had so thank you okay um. I want to move on to uh, a group of other questions people are asking about the impacts on events and activities at the Veterans Hall uh, itself. Um, Kathleen writes, the Vets Building parking lot is used for many events and at the fairgrounds. Will these now these events now be suspended? What are the plans for the future if you take up that space? We don't expect that um, 
this will have a lot of impact on events at the vets building. I know that there are some that take up the whole parking lot at times. Um, they will have to adjust, obviously, but uh, the the lineup of events at the at the vets building should not change, um, will not change as far as um, the county is concerned. Uh, you know, I was at an event there on Friday night where the the main hall was was packed to the rafters, and um, during the meeting, I went out and walked around the parking lot, and the, the, almost this this entire area in the back was was uh, not used by people parking. There were plenty of parking places in the other areas as well, and um, I just want to say that you know I think there's adequate parking there um, for for wherever we decided to place uh, place this shelter if we do choose the veterans building parking lot. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm wondering about if we're getting any questions about the location within the parking lot, Paul. Yes, there are uh, specific questions about the location within the parking lot. Um, and uh, uh, I, uh, so I don't know if you want to, if we want to address that now. I, I, I have, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll mention that a couple of people also mentioned other specific events. Jamie says, how will the, bo the board county know when the managed shelter or other non-veteran activity interferes with veteran activities? He says, already I have heard some people are canceling their scheduled events, such as the 10th annual John Puccioni Memorial Swap Meet and Car Show. While this event is not veteran related, the event raises money for several different charities. Uh, he mentions other uh, charities that use the uh, parking lot. He notes these types of events require the use of the entire parking lot. The parking lot also serves as one of the Luther Burbank Rose Parade staging areas and the Redwood Food Bank distribution sites. Those are some of the activities that some of our uh, our uh, listeners have brought up so yeah well as i said there may be some events that need to adjust but i would certainly uh encourage anyone who has an event at, at the veterans building not to make any decisions about canceling yet uh, we have not settled on this uh as as set in stone yet um I'd like to hear about uh you, you know Want to hear about events that may run into um, difficulties, may need to make adjustments, want to maybe figure the how, out how those adjustments can be made. But don't cancel your event when we don't even know if we're going to do this. Yet. Um, so on that note, do we, uh, does the county know specifically where, which part of the parking lot this will be located? Will it be in the back or the side? Um, I, uh, they, they recognize that it hasn't been firmed up that it's going to happen at the vets building, but do we know where the parking lot's going to be? I think preliminarily, we're looking at the back, back of the building. So not to either side, but to the back of the building. And again, the parking lot behind the building, not the building itself. Okay. And then we have a number of questions related to how the county is working with the veterans themselves. Uh, one uh, vet, uh, veteran mentions, how will the Board of Supervisors determine any actions and activities that uh, the, uh, taken at the property will be in compliance with the California Military and Veterans Code? According to the California Military and Veterans Code, supervisors may incidentally use the veterans moral building for other uses as long as the use does not interfere with the veterans use of the building uh any any uh any answer for that i think that dave said in his presentation that the building itself will not be used uh, at all in relation to a shelter site okay great well, then we have a number of other questions related to um, alternative sites. Uh, and uh, Don asks why, uh, or Deborah asks, why can't the fairgrounds be used? Let's start there. So we did have a conversation with the fairgrounds. Remember, we actually do have a 
uh, homeless, uh, sorry, housing for homeless individuals facility at the fairgrounds. Those are the trailers that are um, in the back of the fairgrounds. Um, during the fair period, um, a, a site like this would would conflict with with fair operations and the fairgrounds itself, which has a which has a governing board, has said um, that that's those spaces are not available to us. Okay, and uh, uh, Don asks, why can't they stay? I guess he's asking, why can't they all stay if we're going to have a site at the county administration center campus? Why can't they all be at that one site? I think this is in line with what Supervisor Corsi mentioned that you, you need to build enough capacity or have enough capacity to successfully clear the trail. Um, in our mind, the, the probably the extreme large capacity for one site is about 60 to 65 to 70 people. So we need to have two, at least an option for two, should we need that. And the, sorry, the county campuses site um, will not accommodate something much larger than that. You, it also becomes unwieldy to manage. You have a, a tighter site, a smaller site, you actually can can uh, take better care of the residents within them that way as well. Great, thank you, Dave. Um, uh, Denise also asks uh, essentially why we can't expand the the Los Gilico site to accommodate uh, more people. Well. Los Gilicos is, is a slightly different model. Um, it, it's set up as 60 pallet shelters. Um, it, it has been used for the past four years as more interim shelter rather than emergency shelter. Um, we believe that at least Los Gilicos is positioned with the right amount of people right now and the right structure right now. The other part of that is what Supervisor Gordon mentioned before is that it's relatively relatively remote to services. Services have to be delivered out there, or and um, the the residents of, of that um, that site uh, need transportation to services in in town, um, and that's part of the cost of running that site. Yeah, again, as Supervisor Corsi mentioned too, a number of the folks who would potentially reside here have jobs. So it's it's services and access to their current jobs. And it's it's not kind to move those folks away from some employment that they're they're working hard to maintain and worked hard to get. Um one of our uh, guests asked uh was asking inquiring about the Russell uh, Avenue site that was brought up at the board meeting ha has that is that still an option? We we continue to look closely at the Russell Avenue site. Yes. Okay, um, and when and I guess the the other question is when do you hope to make a decision on where uh, these sites will be? One or more sites will be. Uh, within the next handful of days. It just that that speaks to the that speaks to the urgency that that we mentioned at the beginning. Um, the encampments along the Joe Rodota Trail continue to grow. We need to have capacity to. Um, to house those folks if we're going to move them off the trail. Uh, that's, it's, not, it's not a safe situation for them. It's not a safe situation for trail users. Um, it, and the, the longer we go, the worse it gets and the harder it is to solve. So there's urgency here. So that uh, brings us to a question about Joe Rodota Trail. Uh, 
what is the timeline? When will the homeless individuals be moved and the and the trail cleared? That one, Matt, would you like to take that one? Introduce yourself, Matt. Sure, uh, Matt Lilligren, Deputy County Council. Um, typically, once we have the site selected and then the site stood up, it would be within a week of the time that the site is ready to accept people that we would be um, have the trail cleared. Uh, the extent of the cleanup may trail past that, but uh, within a week is the goal. And is that timeline um, uh, governed by some uh, court order? Is that, is that correct? It is. Uh, we're required to give uh, individuals reasonable notice and an opportunity to re relocate if they don't want to um, accept services. So typically with uh, uh, it's it's really dictated by logistics and ability to move the individuals once we notice to the point when we're clearing um, with our, our standard uh, practice and protocol for the county is 72 hour notice, um, which we have to extend when we're dealing with longer in, or larger encampments like this. Okay, thanks. Matt, since we have you, uh, we have a couple of legal questions. One is that uh, we've had a couple uh, just very general questions. Uh, why can't the county just remove the encampments along Joe Rodota Trail without creating additional shelter space? Sure, it's been mentioned uh, previously, but there was a, a Court of Appeal decision, Federal Court of Appeals out of the Ninth Circuit in 2019 called Martin versus City of Boise. They basically stated that um, jurisdictions cannot um, penalize criminally individuals for sleeping in public um, unless they have alternative locations to sleep, whether that be through providing shelter or the person has the means to, um, to find or afford shelter themselves or your providing some alternative location for individuals that they can sleep. Um, and because right now our shelter capacity is um, at a, is very limited um, and the number of individuals on the trail exceeds the available shelter. That's why the county was forced to declare a shelter crisis, which gave us the ability to stand up these emergency housing sites um, in an expedited basis so that we can relocate these individuals by providing them with adequate shelter at an alternative location to comply with the law. Great, uh, great, thank you. Um, and uh, so I guess the, the the, the the question then comes, there's a number of questions about how this will resolve the Joe Rodota Trail issue in the long run and how the Joe Rodota Trail will be monitored uh, after this, uh, this step. Yeah, I, do you I, want to take that one or, or someone else? I don't think we have anybody from parks here, but maybe yeah. Matt, you could I, answer. I that. Could, yeah, I can take it. It's fine. Um, well, so it's kind of a combination of processes one you know Matt, you, we, you need to get a little closer to your microphone sorry sorry when we add uh, the additional capacity you know hopefully we will have the ability um, to uh, make a dent in a large amount of the people that we've had as repeat um, individuals that have, have kind of come back to the trail we've been using hotel um, vouchers in the past which have not been for hotel we've placements in the past for 30 days. Um, and so we've had a reoccurrence of individuals. This is a longer term solution. So hopefully in that uh, regard, it should assist with the capacity and the ability. If we have smaller encampments to direct, that pop up on the trail that we can address those quickly before they grow to this large size. The problem that's kind of grown to this point why we want to act quickly is because um, we weren't, we didn't have the capacity to address it when it was kind of in its earlier stages. In addition, we also are in the process of um, uh, bringing back a ordinance amendment to the Board of Supervisors in April, which will give the county more options in terms of dealing with encampments on the trail. I think it, it's, it should be 
noted that uh, the Board of Supervisors and, and staff, we all understand that um, additional enforcement is needed out on, on the trail. And um, you know, if we're going to, we're going to um, great lengths to provide additional shelter. Uh, we will also go to, to links to, to keep the trail clear for, for its intended use. Okay, Matt, I have uh, one more for you and uh, or uh, anybody else. Uh, Mark um, asks, uh, have proper CEQA environmental reviews been conducted for use of the Veterans Memorial as a homeless encampment? Um, so when, when we use this, um, the government code to stand up a emergency housing site, the government code provisions actually provide CEQA exemptions for exactly what we're doing here. And that is part of the resolution that was adopted by the Board of Supervisors um, last week on the 21st. Um, the shelter crisis declaration included within it, um, as read during the board meeting, um, the CEQA exemptions that apply to these site type of um, emergency housing sites. And just for those not familiar with the acronym, it's the California Environmental Quality Act um, that we're exempting. And just one other, um, once the sites, the final sites are selected, the county will be filing a notice of exemption um, for those sites consistent with the declaration by the Board of Supervisors on the 21st. Okay, great, thank you. Um, I'm gonna move on to uh, another area. We have a number of questions, just uh, um, essentially having to do with uh, overall housing and, and uh, issues. Um, Carol asks, is there, is there hope for more permanent housing for these folks in the immediate future? I love that question. So thank you, Carol. Um, I think the answer is yes. And I, I think all of us who work on this county or city are excited about the yes. This involves, again, Project Home Key that I spoke of. We have six Project Home Key uh, projects in Sonoma County, which is higher than many other counties across California. And that's because we're making an investment in the type of housing that will allow people who would stay at this encampment to take that next step. It may be the step they stay the rest of their lives, but it's more likely a step where they will, again, restabilize, get the job they need, get the benefits that they're entitled to, and move, and move on to uh, typical market rate housing or typical affordable housing. We would always like to see more. There's no, no question about that, but in the trajectory, in the pipeline are a good amount of of additional housing that's going in. Again, Petaluma has a project opening in April. Uh, the county has its own project in the river, uh, along the river opening later this fall. Hillsburg's just opened in November. Runner Park's just opened in October. And then the Caritas Center, a great project in Santa Rosa, will have uh, 64 beds just in phase one opening in June. 30 of those will be reserved for people coming out of chronically homeless, chronic homelessness potentially people coming out of just this very encampment. Yeah, I wanna share a comment from uh, Robin Phoenix. She says, I am very excited to see this happen in Santa Rosa. As the director of shelter services at COTS, I understand that shelters are not for everyone. I totally support sanctioned encampments and wish we had leadership in Petaluma that would consider this in South County, she says. Um, uh, let me get to um, another question about uh, uh, from Sally about this site. She says altogether how she wants to know how many people are currently housed in trailers or otherwise other areas at the fairgrounds. Do we have a number on that right now? It's about 35. Okay. Um, I think uh, she, her point is she feels there's already a lot of people uh, homeless in that area. I think that is her main point. 
um, uh, yeah, there's, uh, Stephen says, why is it the county's responsibility to house and financially support able-bodied people who refuse to work, uh, abuse drugs, and engage in other illegal activities? He says, veterans have continued to be disrespected in this county and allowing a homeless encampment at the vets building is just another slap in the face. You know, um, Paul, that this might be a good opportunity for either James or, or Dr. Nassim to kind of talk a little bit more about the clients that that need this housing and kind of what's going on in their lives. That's a really, yes, please. Yes, uh, thank you for that uh, question. I think it's really important um, to address this. Many of our unsheltered individuals um, actually do have jobs um, or they don't have um, drug addictions or they don't have severe uh, behavioral health or mental health issues. Sure, um, some may be suffering from depression as perhaps a lot of people are, um, but they just need a little bit of support from the county, just a little bit in order to establish themselves. They're still contributing to society, um, whether they're students going to school, whether they are working part-time, um, or whether they are working full-time, but just not making enough to be able to purchase a home or rent a home. Um, several people have just recently maybe lost their jobs and they're living in their cars. This includes um, elderly couples um, who are really cold and then freezing in their cars. And, and again, no addiction issues, no mental health issues, no behavioral health issues, but could use a little bit of support in order to be established once again. Um, so I, I think this was a really important and helpful question. Thank you for allowing us to address it. Yeah, and, and thank you, Dr. Nassim. Uh, I just add on the, uh, the substance uh, use disorder part of it. Uh, we have clients who, uh, go through our uh, treatment uh, referrals and finish 90 days and then go <clears throat> through our sober living environment. And they're staying, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, in these uh, sheltered locations and, and repairing their lives. I mean, six months clean and sober. Uh, I just had a case today of a person, six months clean and sober. Uh, and has been utilizing our services. And <clears throat> we're trying to locate a place for him. So, I mean, uh, like everyone says, you know, we're in, in this work to try to help our fellow human beings. And uh, it's not an easy job to, uh, to find places. And so I, I really commend our, our board of supervisors for taking, taking this step. And, uh, yeah, thank you for that question. Appreciate that. I just want to add to the uh, to the question about why is it the county's responsibility? Um, first of all, I think it's all of our responsibility. But um, in the way that our government is set up, we have we have safety net services. Um, they aren't they aren't um, as robust as they probably need to be, but uh, they're delivered through state and federal funds largely through county departments such as our department of health services and our human services department um you know there may be veterans who uh end up living in in these shelters um, this is no disrespect of veterans it's um it's asking all of us to to do our part you know we're also uh, talking about putting one of these shelters on the county campus where, you know, all of us go to work every day, um, where we serve everyone in, in Sonoma County. Um, you know, I, I understand that the veterans see this as an imposition. I, I hope that there isn't a universal feeling of, of disrespect. Um, it's, it, you know, veterans, by by definition, um, are are willing to serve, and you know this is another opportunity for all of us to um, to serve our our fellow uh, our fellow residents of Sonoma County, our fellow citizens. 
Great, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Denise, uh, as a follow-up, she asked, you mentioned, I believe Dave, you mentioned this, you need 1,000 beds for the, the, I don't know if it was specifically, but she says, you mentioned you need 1,000 beds for the mentally ill unhoused. I'm not sure that's necessarily mental health, but anyway, she asked, how many new beds do you think you will have in the next few years? So what, what we're citing there is our recent strategic plan, which said um, our area, if we're to uh, reach what's called functional zero in homelessness, and functional zero doesn't mean there's that no one is homeless. What it means is that if someone does slip into homelessness, it's one time, it's brief, and it's rare for them. In other words, the chronic nature of, for instance, many of the folks who are out on the trail is not there anymore. Someone hasn't been out homeless for so long that they've compounded their behavioral health concerns or their physical health concerns. So um, in order to reach a system where we can reach functional zero, we need about a thousand new uh, permits for housing beds across five years. And that's, that the plan, that's the plan's goal. There's also 200 new beds needed of the type that we're talking about today. And that is this kind of interim housing where you can move to permanent housing eventually. So I mentioned a number of things are in the pipeline. We do expect to see more coming through. There um, developers like Burbank and Midpen Housing um, use both county funds and state funds and federal funds to develop projects that include elements of permanent supportive housing in each one of those projects. So it's a stretch goal, but I don't think it's an unattainable goal. And again, Paul, as you mentioned, this is not just people for behavioral health issues. These could just be people who need some physical assistance or um, or behavioral, but it's not it's not just behavioral health issues that would put someone in permanent supportive housing. Thank you, uh, uh, Denise. Asks. Um, for any of the proposed site, but especially if the veterans building site is selected, what data will be collected to measure the progress and success of the site and will be posted in a manner the public can access? So what we do as a, as a county system, um, we have a number of performance measures associated with homelessness. One is the length of time that someone spends homeless, and that, has, that should be shortened to, to show improvement. Another is returns to homelessness. Did someone get placed in permanent housing and then fall out because we didn't support them right? Another is what will be an important metric for this these projects is placements in permanent housing. How many people were involved in, the, in this encampment, this emergency shelter, who moved to permanent housing? So those are all things that we collect data on and report. I'm happy to share that with you in any format. The main format that will come through is the public continuum of care meetings. And if is it Denise asked that question, if, if you're curious about attending the continuum of care meetings, they're open to all, they're once a month where we talk about things exactly like this. Dave, if you don't mind, I, I add, I also posted a couple of links in the chat uh, occasion or in the Q&A to both our performance measures and uh, links to our continuum of care board meetings as well. Thank you both. That that was a great question from Denise, who's following us on Facebook. So so thank you for that. Um, uh, let me ask. Um, Regina also asks a similar about following the data. Has anyone? Uh, uh, she and a couple others have asked about the actual success of getting people to transfer from an encampment like Joe Rodota Trail to an established shelter like this. Uh, Regina poses it, has anyone asked the homeless population about their willingness to move to either of the sites that you mentioned? Uh, what, what percentage of the people do you think will actually make that transition? Yes, uh, Dr. Nassim or James could answer that. We we ask that of, of this entire population on the trail. Yes, every single day we have our staff out there on the trail with outreach work and they ask um, what services 
do you need? What services would you like? And um, surprisingly, a good um, a good number of individuals who are unsheltered on Jerodota Trail prefer to stay outdoors and have declined um, indoor shelters or have declined even the stays at the hotels. And so we believe based off of our experience and our, um, our, our strong uh, communication uh, with these individuals that this effort is going to significantly reduce the number of encampments on JRT. And what Dr. Nassim noted is, is really an example of trauma. This is an example of where people have been outside so long that yes. being inside is frightening. So yes. that's okay. why an encampment like this we think is integral to the system to give people to start to address that trauma and allow people to be more open to a choice that involves four walls and a roof. Yeah. And even at the trailers, we've had um, individuals who come out saying, we wanna go back on the trail, we can't stay indoors. Hmm. Yeah, and, and just to add to that, you know, <clears throat> uh, a stable environment is uh, something that, uh, you know, people uh, really need to have in order to really uh, take time to consider, you know, the services that are being offered. Uh, in certain situations, it's hard for people to really uh, say, yes, I want this or I want that uh, when they're outside and, you know, in, in the elements. Uh, but once they get into a stable environment, once they are case managed, uh, things uh, change and they become more receptive uh, to accepting uh, certain services. Uh, Dr. Nassim and James, maybe uh, if you could help with this, uh, there's there is still a there's a some questions related to the perception that uh, people are are being uh, sent here or coming here from outside the area to take advantage of our, our services here in Sonoma County. Um, maybe you could speak to that, what, you're, what you found in your discussions with the homeless populations. Well, uh, thank you, Paul. Uh, <clears throat> you know, I see similar individuals uh, that I've seen since 2018. Uh, and some of these folks are chronic, uh, are, are are chronic homeless and uh, they move around and they come back. Uh, but as far as the uh, influx of uh, new individuals, uh, I've not you know, found that to be entirely true. Uh, maybe someone else can speak to that better than I, uh, but, but I've noticed that you know, our population uh, has increased. Uh, so, um, you know, this is something that is troubling, uh, and we're constantly looking for more capacity. Uh, but uh, I, like I said, I, I don't see a gigantic number of people coming from other areas that I could point to. I think uh, Michael can address that yeah. back to the point in time count uh, that we've done. Happy to, to jump in there. Yeah, since 2011, since we've been doing the point in time count, every year, um, except for 2022, the, that percentage of folks who were homeless um, and became homeless in Sonoma County is between 80% and 87%. 2022, it was a little bit lower. It was in the 70s. Um, yeah. uh, so that we don't know if that's an outlier yet, but by and large, folks who become homeless here are our neighbors. Michael, when you say they became homeless in Sonoma County, that means they were living in Sonoma County um, and they had a home and, and became homeless from, from that home in Sonoma County. Correct. Yes, Supervisor. Thanks. That's exactly right. Well, on that note, um, Shelley asks, uh, in reviewing the homeless counts, it, uh, it looks like uh, she, she asks why uh, she's look, seeing that there has been a, a, an increase in our homeless. And she poses the question, why do I see many more homeless people on the street today than ever before? Why is that? That's a broad question. I think I can answer that one too. I think I may have answered this in the, in the Q&A earlier. You know, we had over 4,000 people at one point in our county experiencing homelessness back in 2011. Um, after the Great Recession. Um, one reason 
you know, from, from my perspective, after moving here in 2015 myself, uh, the, the smart train clearance, uh, when that came into play in 2014, 15, a lot of people became more visible that, that have been living around those tracks uh, for years. There's certainly also a phenomenon that went on after uh, COVID where people were not as comfortable in an emergency shelter, in a, especially a congregate shelter. So you, you saw people who would much rather be outside in the elements than inside and potentially exposed to COVID with 200 other people. There were also some additional um, environmental laws about uh, waterways and um, local responsibility for, for pollution. And that caused, frankly, uh, you know, local authorities to do a better job of keeping people from, from camping in, in creek beds and around water. Uh, this is Susan. I want to state the obvious. I think there's not one person in Sonoma County that doesn't understand the increasing costs of rents uh, and to rent apartments in our county. It doesn't matter where you are. And fewer and fewer people can afford the rents, even though many members of the family are working two and three jobs or sometimes living together. So they are evicted from their apartments because they can't afford the rent. They're living in their cars and then their cars break down uh, and sometimes their cars are taken away and there they are camping on the creeks or whatever place, wherever and whenever they can find a place to live with families. We have children living in the tents. And I'm stunned, I'm the senior, one of the seniors on the Zoom. We have many seniors who are homeless, living in their cars, living in the tents, older women in particular, uh, who through lots of different reasons, they may have lost a husband, uh, they may have lost that job or earned very little money. And so the folks that we may see in the encampments are not exactly the folks that you are going to fear. These are the these are our mothers, our grandmothers, our sisters, our brothers, and so I would encourage you to um, not be fearful. But my experience is that often neighbors uh, come together to aid uh, the folks living in uh, the pal shelter homes or trailers. Uh, volunteering with food and clothing. These are our folks. These are our folks living in the county and they're challenged. And I, I hope you find it in your hearts to get to know the folks and not out of fear, but out of empathy and caring. Thank, Thank you. you, Supervisor Gordon. Yes, please. Many times they're also fleeing, these same women um, are fleeing domestic abuse. And it's very difficult to find um, to find help or to try to look for help when, when you're escaping and hiding. Um, I, I'd like to provide one example, if I may. I have um, a dear friend of mine, She's she and her family were homeless, a family of five living in a car. And just with a little bit of support, um, she is now at uh, UC Santa Barbara getting two PhDs, one in physics, one in mathematics. And she's a musical genius, like plays three different instruments, self-taught on her own. And so you'd never think. You'd never think that the people around you, someone behind you, or in a grocery store in a line, or um, are in need of are in need of help. And it's not a, many people are are asking for help either. So they're not typically who we might think they are. Okay, um, a couple of comments I just want to share with you. Um, Desmond says, can we please acknowledge that there are more accessible resources closer to a, the administrative drive site? I, I think they mean the administrative uh, center. Realistically, campers will be on foot and not in cars. Denise says, can you can you agree to start the emergency camps at the county campus first? Um, uh, and somebody asks whether um, uh, are tiny homes still being considered versus tents? Uh, this individual said they are 
uh, tiny homes are more secure, warmer, more aesthetically pleasing alternative. Also, individuals who have lived in tents for long periods of time need to get accustomed to living indoors before moving uh, to permanent housing. Any thoughts on that? So all good points. Uh, we're, we're certainly considering both. Uh, one of the issues is just what can we stand up quickly and then what will people accept? Um, I'd so like to add, you know, that we we are looking at a suite of options here. And, and um, yes, we're trying to stand up something emergent and urgent, but it's also very important to understand that uh, we are dealing with a, a chronically homeless population who we are working with and have been working with persistently and consistently over a number of years who are not yet used to living within the confines of four walls. Their reality is a tent currently or outdoors without any shelter. And so to encourage them to come in and to continue to work with them in a um, holistic and, and uh, a way uh, is to uh, work with them within the confines of a tent. Um, and that does not mean that they will stay in this tent forever. It just simply means that this is their starting place. And so this would allow this particular site would allow our case managers and our care teams to work with them in one location so that they can uh, appropriately set uh, a plan, a housing plan uh, with them, a care plan with them, and, and to get them on the road to recovery and self-sufficiency. So I think that is true, that's really important for you and I to understand. Great, thank you very much. Uh, Chair Corsi, I was gonna do a time check with you. Um, uh, we're at the bottom of the hour. Well, I see that we've got 293 questions in our, in our Q&A. We're obviously not gonna be able to answer everyone's questions tonight. And honestly, as I think I said before, I know I've said this uh, several times over the past week, is, is the, the only way we're gonna answer these questions is by doing this project right. Um, Council Member Rogers mentioned the uh, ongoing community meetings that have been held around um, shelter sites that the city has, has put up over uh, by the family center in the family center's parking lot now across Stony Point at, uh, from the family center at the, um, the utility field office. Uh, I commit you know, to meet, continue, continue, to continue meeting with neighbors of a site wherever we put wherever we put this. Again, we haven't made a decision on the vet site. We haven't made a decision on, on the county site. There are um, there may be other options, but these are the ones that are available right now and we are in a situation where we need right now. So as, as Dave Kiff said, this decision is probably going to be made in, in the coming days. Um, when it is, uh, that message will be communicated to everybody who, who we have um, have heard from. Um, I've been trying to get back to everyone that has emailed and called my office, but um, we will commit to meet with, with the neighbors both before this site is, is constructed and after it is occupied. Um, just want to say that when um, the Project Home Key uh, site was opened at the Hotel Azura in downtown Santa Rosa, right near the intersection of College and Mendocino Avenues, uh, the neighborhood was, was quite concerned uh, about what was gonna, was gonna happen there. Who was going to be housed there? What impact that was going to have on their neighborhood? And they asked many of the same questions that we're hearing from the folks who are on this webinar tonight. Um, completely understandable fears and concerns. We agreed to meet with them. We started meeting with them on a monthly basis. Had a couple of meetings before the site was opened. Um, had a couple of meetings 
in the couple of months after the site was occupied, uh, by the third or fourth month, uh, we had all agreed to go to every other month because there were just fewer people attending and fewer questions being asked. And you know, eventually it went from what's gonna happen to my neighborhood to how can my neighborhood help support these people who are living in, in this project? Um, we haven't had a community meeting about that project for probably more than a year. I can't remember Tina when the last one was, but it's in, it's in my district as well. I haven't heard any complaints about that site um, for that long. Um, so again, we're not going to we're not going to solve the fears and concerns on on this call today. But uh, I, I pledge to continue having the conversation once we make a decision, whether it's here, whether it's out at the county campus, whether it's both. Uh, we will continue to to be in touch with the neighbors and and address any uh, realities that come come to pass. Chair Corsi, I share your commitment and I pledge your continuing uh, commitment to working with the neighbors, especially. I've worked as a school board member, council member, mayor, and now supervisor on homeless issues, working with service providers, understanding the needs uh, and the fears and the concerns of neighbors. And I, I think we can do this. I think we have a responsibility a shared responsibility. And I wanna make sure that wherever we put our managed encampment or encampments uh, has little or no impact on neighborhoods. And I, I know that this can be successful. And I thank uh, council member Seff and Rogers for being with us tonight. We are working together to hear your concerns, answer your concerns on a continuing basis. And my, you think I just represent Sonoma Valley? No, my district goes all the way to Brookwood, including the Memorial Hospital. So I am one of you. I used to be one of your neighbors and I look forward to meeting with you, maybe in person or maybe in Zoom in the future. So I think we're gonna end on that note. Um, I want to thank everybody who's participated tonight. I know that um, we didn't get to all of your questions, but again, we're going to, uh, uh, our communications team is going to go through these questions, create a, a frequently asked questions uh, and answer uh, uh, portion of our website. Um, I want to thank the crew that's helped us do this particularly uh, our interpreters, Julie and Monique, our Spanish interpreters, and Chris and Jennifer, our American Sign Language interpreters. And uh, just lastly, I want to remind everyone that this webinar and the one from Friday have been recorded and will be available to view on our Facebook page and the county's YouTube channel. So with that, I'll, I'll just say thank you and uh, enjoy your evening.